This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, Winter 2006. Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe Chapter 11 Finds Print of Man's Foot on the Sand It would have made a stoic smile to have seen me and my little family sit down to dinner. There was my majesty, the prince and lord of the whole island. I had the lives of all my subjects at my absolute command. I could hang, draw, give liberty, and take it away, and no rebels among all my subjects. Then, to see how like a king I dined, too, all alone, attended by my servants. Paul, as if he had been my favorite, was the only person permitted to talk to me. My dog, who was now grown old and crazy, and had found no species to multiply his kind upon, sat always at my right hand, and two cats, one on one side of the table and one on the other, expecting now and then a bit from my hand as a mark of special favor. But these were not the two cats which I brought on shore at first, for they were both of them dead, and had been interred near my habitation by my own hand. But one of them having multiplied by I know not what kind of creature, there were two which I had preserved tame, and whereas the rest ran wild in the woods and became indeed troublesome to me at last, for they would often come into my house and plunder me too, till at last I was obliged to shoot them, and did kill a great many. At length they left me. With this attendance, and in this plentiful manner, I lived, neither could I be said to want anything but society, and of that some time after this I was likely to have too much. I was something impatient, as I have observed, to have the use of my boat, though very loath to run any more hazards, and therefore sometimes I sat contriving ways to get her about the island, and at other times I sat myself down contented enough without her. But I had a strange uneasiness in my mind to go down to the point of the island where, as I have said in my last ramble, I went up the hill to see how the shore lay, and how the current set, that I might see what I had to do. This inclination increased upon me every day, and at length I resolved to travel thither by land, following the edge of the shore. I did so. But had any one in England met such a man as I was, it must either have frightened him or raised a great deal of laughter, and as I frequently stood still to look at myself, I could not but smile at the notion of my travelling through Yorkshire with such an equipage, and in such a dress. Be pleased to take a sketch of my figure as follows. I had a great, high, shapeless cap, made of a goatskin, with a flap hanging down behind, as well to keep the sun from me as to shoot the rain off from running into my neck, nothing being hurtful in these climates, as the rain might be upon the flesh under the clothes. I had a short jacket of goatskin, the skirts coming down to about the middle of the thighs, and a pair of open knee breeches of the same. The breeches were made of the skin of an old he-goat, whose hair hung down such a length on either side that, like pantaloons, it reached to the middle of my legs. Stockings and shoes I had none, but had made me a pair of somethings, I scarce know what to call them, like buskins, to flap over my legs and lace on either side like spatterdashes, but of a most barbarous shape, as indeed were all the rest of my clothes. I had on a broad belt of goat-skin dried, which I knew 
how to draw together with two thongs of the same instead of buckles, and in a kind of a frog on either side of this, instead of a sword and dagger, hung a little saw and a hatchet, one on one side and one on the other. I had another belt not so broad, and fastened it in the same manner, which hung over my shoulder, and at the end of it, under my left arm, hung two pouches, both made of goat skin too, in one of which hung my powder, and in the other my shot. At my back I carried my basket, and on my shoulder my gun, and over my head a great clumsy ugly goat skin umbrella, but which, after all, was the most necessary thing I had about me next to my gun. As for my face, the color of it was really not so mulatto-like as one might expect from a man not at all careful of it, and living within nine or ten degrees of the equinox. My beard I had once suffered to grow till it was about a quarter of a yard long, but as I had both scissors and razors sufficient, I had cut it pretty short, except what grew on my upper lip, which I had trimmed into a large pair of Mahometan whiskers, such as I had seen worn by some Turks at Salih, for the Moors did not wear such, though the Turks did. Of these mustachios, or whiskers, I will not say they were long enough to hang my hat upon them, but they were of a length and shape monstrous enough, and such as in England would have passed for frightful. But all this is by the by. For as to my figure, I had so few to observe me that it was of no manner of consequence, so I say no more of that. In this kind of dress, I went my new journey, and was out five or six days. I travelled first along the seashore, directly to the place where I first brought my boat to an anchor, to get upon the rocks. And, having no boat now to take care of, I went over the land a nearer way, of the same height that I was upon before, when, looking forward to the points of the rocks which lay out, and which I was obliged to double with my boat, as is said above, I was surprised to see the sea all smooth and quiet, no rippling, no motion, no current, any more than in other places. I was at a strange loss to understand this, and resolved to spend some time in the observing of it, to see if nothing from the sets of the tide had occasioned it but I was presently convinced how it was. That is, that the tide of ebb setting from the west, and joining with the current of waters from some great river on the shore, must be the occasion for this current, and that, according as the wind blew more forcibly from the west, or from the north, this current came nearer, or went farther, from the shore. For waiting thereabouts till evening, I went up to the rock again, and then the tide of ebb being made, I plainly saw the current again as before, only that it ran farther off, being near half a league from the shore, whereas in my case it set close upon the shore, and hurried me and my canoe along with it, which at another time it would not have done. This observation convinced me that I had nothing to do but to observe the ebbing and the flowing of the tide, and I might very easily bring my boat about the island again. But when I began to think of putting it in practice, I had such a terror upon my spirits at the remembrance of the danger I had been in, that I could not think of it again with any patience. But on the contrary, I took up another resolution, which was more safe, though more laborious, and this was that I would build, or rather make, me another periagua, or canoe, and so have one for one side of the island, and one for the other. You are to understand that now I had, as I may call it, two plantations in the island. One, my little fortification or tent, with the wall about it, under the rock, with the cave behind me, which by this time I had enlarged into several apartments or caves, one within another. One of these, which was the driest and largest, 
and had a door out beyond my wall, or fortification, that is to say, beyond where my wall joined to the rock, was all filled up with the large earthen pots of which I have given an account, and with fourteen or fifteen great baskets, which would hold five or six bushels each, where I laid up my stores of provisions, especially my corn, some in the ear, cut off short from the straw, and the other rubbed out with my hand. As for my wall, made as before with long stakes or piles, these piles grew all like trees, and were by this time grown so big and spread so very much, that there was not the least appearance to any one's view of any habitation behind them. Near this dwelling of mine, but a little farther within the land, and upon lower ground, lay my two pieces of corn-land, which I kept duly cultivated and sowed, and which duly yielded me their harvest in its season. And whenever I had occasion for more corn, I had more land adjoining as fit as that. Besides this, I now had my country seat, and I had now a tolerable plantation there also. For first I had my little bower, as I called it, which I kept in repair, that is to say I kept the hedge which encircled it constantly fitted up to its usual height, the latter always standing on the inside. I kept the trees, which at first were no more than stakes, but were now grown very firm and tall, always cut, so that they might spread and grow thick and wild, and make the more agreeable shade, which they did effectually to my mind. In the middle of this I had my tent always standing, being a piece of a sail spread over poles, set up for that purpose, and which never wanted any repair or renewing. And under this I made me a squab or couch with the skins of the creatures I had killed, and with other soft things, and a blanket laid on them, such as belonged to our sea bedding, which I had saved, in a great watch coat to cover me. And here, whenever I had occasion to be absent from my chief seat, I took up my country habitation. Adjoining to this, I had my enclosures for my cattle, that is to say, my goats, and I had taken an inconceivable deal of pains to fence and enclose this ground. I was so anxious to see it kept entire, lest the goats should break through, that I never left off till, with infinite labor, I had stuck the outside of the hedge so full of small stakes, and so near one to another, that it was rather a pail than a hedge, and there was scarce room to put a hand through between them, which, afterwards, when these stakes grew, as they all did in the next rainy season, made the enclosure strong like a wall, indeed stronger than any wall. This will testify for me that I was not idle, and that I spared no pains to bring to pass whatever appeared necessary for my comfortable support, for I considered the keeping up a breed of tame creatures thus at my hand would be a living magazine of flesh, milk, butter, and cheese for me as long as I lived in the place, if it were to be forty years, and that keeping them in my reach depended entirely upon my perfecting my enclosures to such a degree that I might be sure of keeping them together, which by this method, indeed, I so effectually secured, that when these little stakes began to grow, I had planted them so very thick that I was forced to pull some of them up again. In this place also I had my grapes growing, which I principally depended on for my winter store of raisins, and which I never failed to preserve very carefully, as the best and most agreeable dainty of my whole diet. And indeed they were not only agreeable, but medicinal, wholesome, nourishing and refreshing to the last degree. As this was about halfway between my other habitation and the place where I had laid up my boat, I generally stayed and lay here in my way thither, for I used frequently to visit my boat, and I kept all things about or belonging to her in very good order. Sometimes I went out in her to divert myself, 
but no more hazardous voyages would I go, scarcely ever above a stone's cast or two from the shore. I was so apprehensive of being hurried out of my knowledge again by the currents or winds, or any other accident. But now I come to a new scene of my life. It happened one day about noon, going towards my boat, I was exceedingly surprised with the print of a man's naked foot on the shore, which was very plain to be seen in the sand. I stood like one thunderstruck, or as if I had seen an apparition. I listened, I looked round me, but I could hear nothing nor see anything. I went up to a rising ground to look farther. I went up the shore and down the shore, but it was all one. I could see no other impression but that one. I went to it again to see if there were any more, and to observe if it might not be my fancy. But there was no room for that, for there was exactly the print of a foot, toes, heel, and every part of a foot. How it came thither I knew not, nor could I in the least imagine, but after innumerable fluttering thoughts, like a man perfectly confused and out of myself, I came home to my fortification, not feeling, as we say, the ground I went on, but terrified, to the last degree, looking behind me at every two or three steps, mistaking every bush and tree, and fancying every stump at a distance, to be a man. Nor is it possible to describe how many various shapes my affrighted imagination represented things to me, how many wild ideas were found every moment in my fancy, and what strange, unaccountable whimsies came into my thoughts by the way. When I came to my castle, for so I think I called it ever after this, I fled into it like one pursued. Whether I went over by the ladder as first contrived, or went in at the hole in the rock, which I had called a door, I cannot remember. No, nor could I remember the next morning, for never frightened hare fled to cover, or fox to earth, with more terror of mind than I to this retreat. I slept none that night. The farther I was from the occasion of my fright, the greater my apprehensions were, which is something contrary to the nature of such things, and especially to the usual practice of all creatures in fear. But I was so embarrassed with my own frightful ideas of the thing, that I formed nothing but dismal imaginations to myself, even though I was now a great way off. Sometimes I fancied it must be the devil, and reason joined in with me in this supposition, for how could any other thing in human shape come into the place? Where was the vessel that brought them? What marks were there of any other footstep? And how was it possible a man should come there? But then to think that Satan should take human shape upon him in such a place, where there could be no manner of occasion for it, but to leave the print of his foot behind him, and that even for no purpose, too, for he could not be sure I should see it. This was an amusement the other way. I considered that the devil might have found out abundance of other ways to have terrified me than this of the single print of a foot, that as I lived quite on the other side of the island, he would never have been so simple as to leave a mark in a place where it was ten thousand to one, whether I should ever see it or not, and in the sand, too, which the first surge of the sea, upon a high wind, would have defaced entirely. All this seemed inconsistent with the thing itself, and with all the notions that we usually entertain of the subtlety of the devil. Abundance of such things as these assisted to argue me out of all apprehensions of its being the devil, and I presently concluded then that it must be some more dangerous creature, that is, that it must be some of the savages of the mainland opposite, 
who had wandered out to sea in their canoes, and either driven by the currents or by contrary winds, had made the island, and had been on shore, but were now gone away to sea, being as loath perhaps to have stayed in this desolate island as I would have been to have had them. While these reflections were rolling in my mind, I was very thankful in my thoughts that I was so happy as not to be thereabouts at that time, or that they did not see my boat, by which they would have concluded that some inhabitants had been in the place, and perhaps have searched farther for me. Then terrible thoughts racked my imagination about their having found out my boat, and that there were people here, and that, if so, I should certainly have them come again in greater numbers and devour me. That if it should happen that they should not find me, yet they would find my enclosure, destroy all my corn, and carry away all my flock of tame goats, and I should perish at last for mere want. Thus my fear banished all my religious hope, all that former confidence in God, which was founded upon such wonderful experience as I had had of his goodness, as if he that had fed me by miracle hitherto could not preserve by his power the provision which he had made for me by his goodness. I reproached myself with my laziness that would not sow any more corn one year than would just serve me till the next season, as if no accident could intervene to prevent my enjoying the crop that was upon the ground. And this I thought so just a reproof, that I resolved for the future to have two or three years corn beforehand, so that whatever might come, I might not perish for want of bread. How strange a checker work of providence is the life of a man, and by what secret different springs are the affections hurried about as different circumstances present. Today we love what tomorrow we hate. Today we seek what tomorrow we shun. Today we desire what tomorrow we fear, nay, even tremble at the apprehensions of. This was exemplified in me at this time in the most lively manner imaginable. For I, whose only affliction was that I seemed banished from human society, that I was alone, circumscribed by the boundless ocean, cut off from mankind, and condemned to what I call silent life, that I was as one whom heaven thought not worthy to be numbered among the living, or to appear among the rest of his creatures, that to have seen one of my own species would have seemed to me a raising me from death to life, and the greatest blessing that heaven itself, next to the supreme blessing of salvation, could bestow. I say that I should now tremble at the very apprehensions of seeing a man, and was ready to sink into the ground at but the shadow or silent appearance of a man having set his foot in the island. Such is the uneven state of human life, and it afforded me a great many curious speculations afterwards, when I had a little recovered my first surprise. I considered that this was the station of life the infinitely wise and good providence of God had determined for me, that, as I could not foresee what the ends of divine wisdom might be in all this, so I was not to dispute his sovereignty who, as I was his creature, had an undoubted right by creation to govern and dispose of me absolutely as he thought fit, and who, as I was a creature that had offended him, had likewise a judicial right to condemn me to what punishment he thought fit, and that it was my part to bear his indignation, because I had sinned against him. I then reflected that as God, who was not only righteous but omnipotent, had thought fit thus to punish and afflict me, so he was able to deliver me, that if he did not think fit to do so, it was my unquestioned duty to resign myself absolutely and entirely to his will, 
and, on the other hand, it was my duty also to hope in him, pray to him, and quietly to attend to the dictates and directions of his daily providence. These thoughts took up many hours of mine, days, nay, I may say weeks and months, and one particular effect of my cogitations on this occasion I cannot omit. One morning early, lying in my bed and filled with thoughts about my danger from the appearances of savages, I found it discomposed me very much, upon which these words of the scripture came into my thoughts. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Upon this, rising cheerfully out of my bed, my heart was not only comforted, but I was guided and encouraged to pray earnestly to God for deliverance. When I had done praying, I took up my Bible, and opening it to read, the first words that presented to me were, Wait on the Lord, and be of good cheer, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It is impossible to express the comfort this gave me. In answer, I thankfully laid down the book and was no more sad, at least on that occasion. In the middle of these cogitations, apprehensions, and reflections, it came into my thoughts one day that all this might be a mere chimera of my own, and that this foot might be the print of my own foot when I came on shore from my boat. This cheered me up a little, too, and I began to persuade myself it was all a delusion, that it was nothing else but my own foot, and why might I not come that way from the boat as well as I was going that way to the boat? Again, I considered also that I could by no means tell for certain where I had trod and where I had not, and that if at last this was the only print of my own foot, I had played the part of those fools who try to make stories of specters and apparitions, and then are frightened at them more than anybody. Now I began to take courage and to peep abroad again, for I had not stirred out of my castle for three days and nights, so that I began to starve for provisions, for I had little or nothing within doors but some barley cakes and water. Then I knew that my goats wanted to be milked, too, which usually was my evening diversion, and the poor creatures were in great pain and in inconvenience for want of it, and indeed it almost spoiled some of them and almost dried up their milk. Encouraging myself, therefore, with the belief that this was nothing but the print of one of my own feet, and that I might be truly said to start at my own shadow, I began to go abroad again, and went to my country house to milk my flock, but to see with what fear I went forward, how often I looked behind me, how I was ready every now and then to lay down my basket and run for my life, it would have made any one have thought I was haunted with an evil conscience, or that I had been lately most terribly frightened, and so indeed I had. However, I went down thus two or three days, and having seen nothing, I began to be a little bolder, and to think there was really nothing in it but my own imagination. But I could not persuade myself fully of this till I should go down to the shore again, and see this print of a foot, and measure it by my own, and see if there was any similitude or fitness, that I might be assured that it was my own foot. But when I came to the place, first, it appeared evidently to me, that when I laid up my boat I could not possibly be on shore anywhere thereabouts. Secondly, when I came to measure the mark with my own foot, I found my foot not so large by a great deal. Both these things filled my head with new imaginations, and gave me the vapors again to the highest degree, so that I shook with cold like one in an ague. And I went home again, filled with the belief that some man or men had been on shore there, or, in short, 
that the island was inhabited, and I might be surprised before I was aware, and what course to take for my security I knew not. Oh, what ridiculous resolutions men take when possessed with fear! It deprives them of the use of those means which reason offers for their relief. The first thing I proposed to myself was to throw down my enclosures and turn all my tame cattle wild into the woods, lest the enemy should find them, and then frequent the island in prospect of the same or the like booty. Then the simple thing of digging up my two cornfields, lest they should find such a grain there, and still be prompted to frequent the island. Then to demolish my bower and tent, that they might not see any vestiges of habitation, and be prompted to look farther, in order to find out the persons inhabiting. These were the subject of the first night's cogitations after I was home again, while the apprehensions which had so overrun my mind were fresh upon me, and my head was full of vapours. Thus fear of danger is ten thousand times more terrifying than danger itself, when apparent to the eyes, and we find the burden of anxiety greater by much than the evil which we are anxious about. And what was worse than all this, I had not that relief in this trouble that from the resignation I used to practice I hoped to have. I looked, I thought, like Saul, who complained not only that the Philistines were upon him, but that God had forsaken him, for I did not now take due ways to compose my mind by crying to God in my distress, and resting upon his providence as I had done before, for my defense and deliverance, which, if I had done, I had at least been more cheerfully supported under this new surprise, and perhaps carried through it with more resolution. This confusion of my thoughts kept me awake all night, but in the morning I fell asleep, and having, by the amusement of my mind, been, as it were, tired, and my spirits exhausted, I slept very soundly, and waked much better composed than I had ever been before. And now I began to think sedately, and upon debate with myself I concluded that this island, which was so exceedingly pleasant, fruitful, and no farther from the mainland than as I had seen, was not so entirely abandoned as I might imagine, that, although there were no stated inhabitants who lived on the spot, yet that there might sometimes come boats off from the shore who, either with design, or perhaps never but when they were driven by cross winds, might come to this place, that I had lived there fifteen years now, and not met with the least shadow or figure of any people yet, and that if at any time they should be driven here, it was probable they went away again as soon as ever they could, seeing that they had never thought fit to fix here upon any occasion that the most I could suggest any danger from was from any casual, accidental landing of straggling people from the main, who, as it was likely if they were driven hither, were here against their wills. So they made no stay here, but went off again with all possible speed, seldom staying one night on shore, lest they should not have the help of the tides and daylight back again and that therefore I had nothing to do but to consider of some safe retreat, in case I should see any savages land upon the spot. Now I began sorely to repent that I had dug my cave so large as to bring a door through again, which door, as I said, came out beyond where my fortification joined to the rock. Upon maturely considering this, therefore, I resolved to draw me a second fortification, in the manner of a semicircle, at a distance from my wall, just where I had planted a double row of trees about twelve years before, of which I made mention. These trees, having been planted so thick before they wanted but few piles to be driven between them, 
that they might be thicker and stronger, and my wall would be soon finished. So that I now had a double wall, and my outer wall was thickened with pieces of timber, old cables, and everything I could think of, to make it strong, having in it seven little holes about as big as I might put my arm out at. In the inside of this I thickened my wall to about ten feet thick, with continually bringing earth out of my cave, and laying it at the foot of the wall, and walking upon it, and through the seven holes I contrived to plant the muskets, of which I took notice that I had got seven on shore out of the ship. These I planted like my cannon, and I fitted them into frames, that held them like a carriage, so that I could fire all the seven guns in two minutes' time. This wall I was many a weary month in finishing, and yet never thought myself safe till it was done. When this was done, I stuck all the ground without my wall, for a great length every way, as full with stakes or sticks of the osier-like wood, which I had found so apt to grow, as they could well stand, insomuch that I believe I might set in near twenty thousand of them, leaving a pretty large space between them and my wall, that I might have room to see my enemy, and they might have no shelter from the young trees, if they attempted to approach my outer wall. Thus in two years' time I had a thick grove, and in five or six years' time I had a wood before my dwelling, growing so monstrously thick and strong that it was indeed perfectly impassable, and no men of what kind soever could ever imagine that there was anything beyond it, much less a habitation. As for the way which I proposed to myself to go in and out, for I left no avenue, it was by setting two ladders, one to a part of the rock which was low, and then broke in, and left room to place another ladder upon that, so that when the two ladders were taken down, no man living could come down to me without doing himself mischief. And if they had come down, they were still on the outside of my outer wall. Thus I took all the measures human prudence could suggest for my own preservation, and it will be seen at length that they were not altogether without just reason, though I foresaw nothing at that time more than my mere fear suggested to me. End of chapter 11